Table five. All right. Now let's uh, uh, look at Isaiah 45. Isaiah 45. And we're going to begin reading here in verse 18. Isaiah 45 and verse 18. The Bible says, For thus saith the Lord that created the heavens. You remember that's the one we talked about last Sunday. The same one that is here today with us. When we talked about what does God want from me. That God. For thus saith uh, the Lord that created the heavens. God himself that formed the earth and made it. He hath established it. He created it not in vain. He formed it to be inhabited. By the way, that same could be said of his church. Amen. He builds it to be inhabited. Hallelujah. And God's people worshiping God and gathering together. And so he created this earth to be inhabited. And uh, he said in the last part of verse 18, I am the Lord and there is none else. I have not spoken in secret. Guess what? God, God's not been hiding from you or hiding his word from you. I have not spoken in secret in a dark place of the earth. I said not unto the seed of Jacob, seek ye me in vain. What a wonderful statement that is. If you, the Bible says if you seek the Lord, he will be found of you. Amen. It's not a vain thing. I, the Lord, speak righteousness. I declare the things that are right. Assemble yourselves and come. Draw near together, ye that are escaped of the nations, that have no knowledge, that set up the wood of their graven image. Notice what he's saying here. You need to flee from and escape idolatry. And you need to come to the living God. And we addressed that to some degree last week too, continuing this morning, of course. But, uh, and pray unto a God that cannot save. There's a lot of people doing that right now this morning. Tell ye and bring them near. Yea, let them take counsel together. Uh, who hath declared this from ancient time? Who hath told it from that time? Have not I the Lord? And there is no God else beside me, a just God and a Savior. There is none beside me. Look unto me and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is none else. I have sworn by myself the word is gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return. That unto me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear. Lord, we pray that you will help us uh, to consider where we stand before you this morning. Uh, so that we'll be ready for that time that you have prepared uh, before us. When we all will bow the knee and answer to you. I pray, Lord, that you would please cleanse me of sin and help me to be filled with the Spirit, that we may be able to preach the Word in truth for your glory and for the help of these that hear it this morning. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. He says uh, back here in verse number 22, uh, quoted this uh, last Sunday, Look unto me and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is none else. We hear a lot about that word saved. We hear a lot about that word salvation. Uh, but we live in a day of confusion concerning the meaning of salvation, what it means to be born again. And uh, many people attend church for years and never understand how to be saved. Well, the Bible, of course, doesn't desire that for you. The Bible wants you to know and to be clear about it. And back in verse 19, the Lord makes that clear when he says, I've not spoken in secret uh, in a dark place of the earth. God is not trying to hide salvation from you. God is not trying to keep you from being saved. If you don't know Christ as your Savior this morning, he is calling to you, as we said last week. Look unto me there in verse 22, and be ye saved. God is always in the business of clarifying the matter of salvation because that's why he sent his son, Jesus, into the world. Jesus said that he came to bring salvation, not to, not to condemn, but to bring salvation. And so right here, even in this Old Testament passage, in ver and specifically in verse number 22, uh, we see the gamut uh, of the doctrine of salvation in four points. 
The first thing we see this morning from Isaiah 45, 22 is the authority on salvation. You see that in the first phrase of verse 22. Look unto me. Look unto me and be ye saved. That word me refers to God. God is the authority and the author of salvation. And so if you're going to have eternal salvation, you're going to have to get it from him or you're not going to get it. You're not going to be able to obtain it on your own. You're going to have to get it from God. A uh, matter of fact, uh, that he is the author. We preached uh, some time ago out of Genesis 3.15 around Christmas time, uh, where we find the first gospel, if you will, uh, in uh, Genesis 3.15, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman there in the garden with the serpent, as where this is being said, and between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. And we preached out of that the doctrine of salvation, how that Jesus defeated Satan for us on our behalf on the cross of Calvary. He crushed his head once for all. God is the author, and Jesus Christ is the means of salvation. John chapter 5 and verse 21, the Lord said himself, For as the Father raiseth up the dead and quickeneth them, even so the Son quickeneth whom he will. And that word quickeneth means gives life. It's the Son of God, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, that gives us eternal life. And God says why in verse 23 of John 5, that all men should honor the Son even as they honor the Father. And uh, he that honoreth not the Son honoreth not the Father which hath sent him. We learn there as well as in other verses that just believing there's a God is not enough to, uh, to uh, permit your entrance into heaven. Because James tells us uh, that the devils believe in God and tremble. The devils. And so it's not about just believing there's a God. There must be a belief in Jesus Christ. And he makes that statement in John 14, 1. You believe in God, believe also in me. As you know, God, uh, Jesus, of course, we believe is God in the flesh. But it wasn't God the Father on the cross of Calvary for you. It was God the Son. And yet our world is uh, uh, full of false gospels that deny the person and the work of Jesus Christ. That's why Jesus warned himself in John 10 and 1, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. Get this. There are a whole lot of people in this world, listen, that are trying to steal their way into heaven. But you're not going to be able to do that before God, an all-seeing, almighty God. You'll have to come through the door, Jesus Christ. In John 1 and verse 12, the Bible says, But as many as received him, uh, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. You're going to have to be born of God if you're going to see heaven when you die. Because Jesus Christ is not a partial Savior. He is the only Savior, and He will not share that work or that glory with anyone or anything else. He will not share that glory with any church. He's not going to share that glory with any individual. Let me tell you, the Baptist church is not the source of your salvation. Now, we want to preach the source of it. Amen. But the church itself, church membership is not the source of your salvation. A lot of people will go to heaven and say, well, now I was a member of such and such church. And that's not going to mean a thing if they don't know Christ as Savior. The text here does not say, uh, look unto the church, look to your good life, look to your baptism, look to your reformation, look to your church ordinances, uh, look uh, to your religiosity. It doesn't say that at all. God said, look to me. Look to me. And so this man, Jesus Christ, who... The, the God-man who divided history into B.C. and A.D. I know they don't use that anymore. But that's because they're trying to deny Jesus. Uh, he, he either is the world's greatest con artist or he is the savior of all mankind. Uh, he is either a liar or he is who he claimed to be, the son of God. And you have to make up your mind about what you're going to believe and do with Jesus Christ. Nobody can make that up for you. You have to make that decision. It is, and thank God for it because that means it's a personal relationship. Not just checking a block or 
being a number, if you will. He's numbered the hairs of your head. Uh, and that means you're more than a number to him. Amen. And so uh, you have to make up your mind. Matter of fact, one of the most piercing questions in Scripture is in Matthew 27, 22, where Pilate said, What shall I do then with Jesus, which is called the Christ? Uh, and uh, not only did Pilate have to figure out what he was going to do with Jesus, but you're going to have to figure it out as well. What are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about him? How are you going to come to know him? Uh, are you willing to make that decision and not put it off any longer? If the Lord did tell the truth, then we have to, of course, uh, uh, face what the Bible says of him and what he said of himself. In John 14, 6, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. That's what Jesus said. I am the only way to get to God. In Acts 14 and 12, neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. None other name but that of Jesus. In John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. In John 3 and 18, he that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already. You realize that? If you have yet to believe on the Lord and receive him as your Savior, it's not a matter of you waiting till after death to be condemned. You're condemned already. Why? Because the Bible says you have not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. John, 1 John 5 and 12. He, hath, uh, he that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son hath not life. God doesn't say he that hath a church, he that, he, he that hath a denomination, he that hath a baptism. We're fixing to baptize. But that baptism has nothing to do uh, with earning salvation. Baptism is just a reflection, that a, 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 a visible testimony that I have believed in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. I have already believed. Water can't wash away sin. You know, it's funny people believe that, and then they talk about how bad the water is in their town. I mean, you'd think if you're going to wash away sin, it'd have to be perfectly pure water, and there isn't any. Yeah, I know it. You buy it in the store in the bottles, and you think you're good to go. But water doesn't wash away sin anyway. Uh, it's the blood of Christ applied to our heart by faith. The Lord doesn't say you need to have a good moral life. Uh, the Lord doesn't talk about good intentions. The Lord talks about you either have Jesus Christ in your heart or you don't. You either have the Son and salvation or you don't have the Son and you have condemnation. That's the end of it. Uh, it, it it's pretty simple for us to understand. A millionaire is not a millionaire until he has the millionth dollar. Right? Now, I know that's really deep, but it's true. And so a, a person is not a Christian until they have Christ. And so what is your hope of heaven this morning? When you stand before God after death, and you will, the Bible says in Hebrews 9, 27, is appointed unto men that wants to die, and after this, the judgment. So when you stand before God and he asked you, if he did, uh, if he were to, I, he's not going to, but if he were to, why should I let you into heaven? Your answer uh, had better not be because I lived a good life, because I went to church often, because I was faithful to confession, because I followed the Lord in baptism. Uh, no, no. If any of those are your immediate response, the response of your heart, then if you were to die today and go to heaven, uh, you would hear the words, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. And so for all, our only hope of heaven is Jesus Christ. The old hymn says, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ, the solid rock, I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. And so if you would get into heaven, you must be able to say with all honesty, my only hope of heaven is that Jesus Christ died for me and I'm resting and tr uh, trusting his finished work for me on the cross of Calvary. Nothing and no one else. Because he is the source of salvation. One of the saddest truths is that so many people are looking to some other thing. Primarily religion. And after religion will be a personal goodness. 
You know what's really hard in this world to find somebody that says, look here. Uh, uh, look here. I, I'm, I, I'm the, like Paul said, I'm the chiefest of sinners. It's hard to find that. The Bible says that every man will, per, will, will declare his own goodness, but a faithful man who can find. You know what that means? Now, that means you need to be honest. You need to be more honest than that. Because the Bible says there's none good, no, not one. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the wages of that sin is death. God wrote the book. God is the authority on salvation. If you're going to have it, you're going to have to get it from him as a free gift and no way else. But then I want you to see not only the authority of salvation, but look at the availability of salvation from this same verse. Look unto me and be ye saved all the ends of the earth. The availability of salvation is everyone. Every person. It doesn't matter where you are today in your life in this world. It doesn't matter how bad things are. It doesn't even matter how good things are. Everything in your world could be turned into a ruckus and falling apart. It doesn't matter. Jesus will receive you and Jesus will save you if you will come to him in repentance and faith. Uh, look unto me, all the ends of the earth. Everybody needs and is a prospect for salvation and the forgiveness of sin. There are some people in this world, materially speaking, they don't need some things. And certainly it's true that not all of us need everything. Uh, but there is nobody alive who doesn't need forgiveness and salvation of the soul. Why? The Bible says in Romans 3.23, as I said, for all have sinned. And the wage of that, of that sin is death. The point is, we must all be forgiven or we're all going to be doomed. Revelation 3.19 says, Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. All the world is guilty before God. You know, it's like people can't have a hard time admitting they're sinners because they feel like everybody else isn't. But the fact of the matter is, everybody else is. Uh, and so the difference is just the state of their relationship with Jesus Christ and their fellowship with Him. Uh, uh, he, all the world's become guilty before God. That's Romans 3.19. But listen at Romans 11.32. Because some people have the idea that God's condemned everybody so he can judge everybody. But listen to 11, uh, Romans 11.32. For God hath, hath concluded them all in unbelief. That's right. <laughs> that he might have mercy upon all. Upon all. There is no such thing as a limited atonement in the Bible. Jesus Christ died for the entirety of the world. And when we talk about that, we're talking about the people. The Bible says in Hebrews 2 and 9, we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels and tasted death for every man. 1 John 2 and 2 says he is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. Again, we read in John three sixteen that whosoever believeth in him. 2 Peter 3 and 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some men count slackness, but his long suffering to us were not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. 1 Timothy 2, chapter 3, and specifically in verse number 4, uh, says that God is one who will have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. That doesn't mean that everybody is saved. And we've mentioned this to you before, uh, that don't believe this lie uh, that goes around people trying to salve their own conscience to make themselves feel better and say, well, now we're all God's children, aren't we? Mm -mm. Jesus didn't believe that because he told the Pharisees and all, he said, you're of your father, the devil. And so we become God's children. We are God's children in the fact that God gave us life, that God created life, but we don't become his children until we become his sons by faith, faith in the name of Jesus Christ and joint heirs with Christ. And so not only did he die on the cross for all people, but he invites them to come. Come unto me, all ye that labor and heavily. Come. How long are you going to wait? What are you waiting on? The Lord has said, Come. Come to him. And you know, if, if, if I, uh, there's a lot of people talk about believing the Bible that don't. Uh, and they're, you know, it's, it, it's pretty, um, it, it, we, we feel like it's more acceptable of us to say that we have some reverence for religion. Or we have some respect for the Bible. And we say, well, I, I believe the Bible. Uh, and they continue on in their life in a lost state. That's proof positive that they don't believe the Bible. Here's the thing. If I believe what the Bible says, 
uh, about the fact that I, I don't know what tomorrow may hold. That my life is but a vapor. It's here today and gone tomorrow. And if I don't know Christ as my Savior, if I pass into eternity by way of death, uh, I am going to end up in a devil's hell. If I believe the Bible, you know what I'm going to do? I'm running to Jesus. So how many, how come so many don't? Because they're, they're more uh, wrapped up in what they enjoy in life than what God is willing to deliver them from in life. I'm telling you, I was born out of a drunkard's life. Uh, out of a sorry, rock and roll, licentious lifestyle. And I'm glad Jesus delivered me from it. I'm not only glad that he saved my soul, but that he changed my life. And I don't have that baggage anymore, dragging it around with me all the time. Hallelujah and amen. And he'll do it for you too. It's not just one. It's not just a few. Now, Jesus said there are a few. There are a few that be saved. Why? They choose the broad way instead of the narrow way. They choose their way instead of God's way. They choose the world's way rather than the Lord's, rather than the Lord's way. But God has said, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You know that's what I experienced at that altar that morning when I received Christ. And I'm going to tell you one thing. Jesus saved me from my sin, but he hadn't yet saved me from my consequences at that point. I still had some things to deal with because of my uh, nincompoop ways. Let's just put it that way. Boy, I, I'm telling you, but you know, at that moment when the Lord saved me, I can, I can honestly say it didn't matter. I mean, I'd just come out the night before out of the jailhouse, out of the brig. If you want to call an Air Force jail a brig. Some call it a Hampton Inn. But uh, anyway, <laughs> I had just come out of jail the night before for what I'd done. But I'll tell you one thing. Uh, at the moment that the Lord saved my soul and all of that weight of sin was lifted off me, uh, I didn't know what was going to happen. I didn't know what God was going to do. But I do know this. Because of the forgiveness of sin, there was peace in my heart with the Savior. There was peace in my heart with Him. And He'll do the same for you. The Spirit, the Revelation 22 and 17, the Spirit and the bride say, Come, let him that hears say, Come, let him that is thirst come. Whosoever will, whosoever will, will let him take of the water of life freely. That's the last invitation in the Bible. And the doors are wide open. Whosoever will. The only person that Jesus Christ cannot save is the one that refuses to believe on him. Jesus said in John 5 and 40, and ye will not come to me that ye might have life. He didn't say you cannot come. He said you will not come. Why don't people come? I just I asked that question a minute ago. Rhetoric. Why don't they come? Because they want to enjoy the pleasures of sin. And here's what people think. They say to themselves, well, now, if I go down there and profess Christ my Savior, I'm not going to be able to do this. I'm not going to be able to do that. Right? Like all that stuff has made your life a bowl of cherries. And so Jesus said, you will not come to me. Christ's death, burial, and resurrection is sufficient to cover all the sin of all mankind for all eternity. The Bible says in 1 Timothy 4 and 10, For therefore we labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men, especially those that believe. So God uh, uh, tells us here in verse 22 of Isaiah 45 that He is the authority of salvation. Then He tells us that the availability of salvation is the doors wide open. Today is the day of salvation. Uh, and then He speaks to us about the avenue of salvation. Now, how are we going to get there? I know uh, what I went through, what God had to allow me to go through to turn my eyes and my heart to Him. Um, and I know what, what the Bible teaches about how God uh, 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 saves a soul. How do I get there? He tells us the avenue right here in that one word. First word in verse 22. Look. Look. Look unto me and be ye saved. All that one has to do is look to Jesus Christ. And this is where so many people stumble. In Matthew 19 and 16, the Bible says uh, of the one, uh, the one fellow that came to the Lord and said, Good Master, what things shall I do 
that I may have eternal life? That is the human question. If you talk about heaven and you talk about hell, anybody in their right mind is going to make the right decision and say, I want to go to heaven. But heaven's not the first thing. Heaven is the result of a a moment in time when we repent of our sin and trust Christ as our Savior. It's the result of a salvation moment on earth. Uh, But people see heaven uh, if they believe anything about the Bible and they hear something out of the Word of God about hell and they say, well, boy, I don't want to go there. So what do I need to do? That's the way we think. I'm going to pull myself up by my own bootstraps. I'll figure this out. I'll get it done if somebody tells me what I need to do. That's human effort. We feel like we've got to help God out. That's what was wrong with the Jews, Paul said in Romans 10 and 3, for they being ignorant of God's righteousness, which is what we need to get to heaven, and going about to establish their own righteousness, which the Bible says is basically as filthy rags. They have not submitted. That's the problem. They have not submitted to the righteousness of God. You know what? We have to come to a place where we say, I cannot do it. And if God doesn't help me, if God doesn't save me, if God doesn't have mercy on me, I'm not going to be saved. Because there's nothing I can do. He says, look unto me and be you saved. Uh, the self-effort, uh, this self-effort uh, would avail uh, uh, them nothing. And so this thought of looking to God uh, for life is illustrated in Numbers 21 and beginning in verse 8. And the Lord said to Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, set it upon a pole, and it shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, the fiery serpent on the pole, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass and put it on a pole, and it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, uh, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. Now that pole is a picture of the cross. And that serpent, Satan and sin, that were defeated on the cross when Jesus was made sin for us who knew no sin. Before he ever went to the cross, the Lord said of his work on the cross, Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. He was talking about Satan. He won the victory by his death on the cross of Calvary. He defeated Satan by that death. That's why the hymn says, I have a message from the Lord, hallelujah, a message unto you I'll give. Tis recorded in his word, hallelujah, it is only that you look and live. Look and live, my brother, live. Look to Jesus now and live. And somebody's going to say, how can something so wonderful be obtained so easily? The response to that is it's only easy for us because Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Our text does not say look unto me and turn over a new leaf. Look unto me and live right. Keep the Ten Commandments. Promise you'll never sin again and you'll be saved. It says look unto me and be ye saved. If we had to promise to never sin again, we'd never make it. Tough, ain't it? Tough medicine. Big pill. Got to swallow it. Now, Christians ought to live right. That's right. I don't like this idea we're just sinners saved by grace, so we'll just do whatever we want and God will forgive us. No, that's, that Bible calls that licentiousness. In other words, because of God's grace, we have license to live however we want to. We don't believe that at all. We believe that when God saves a person, he changes their wanter. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. God changes your heart and changes your life. And so the old preachers used to say, if there is no sanctification, there is no salvation. But James 4 and 17 says, Therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it's sin. I wonder how many have already sinned. How many of us? Him that doeth knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it's sin. Shouldn't he eat in that second sin of bond? I know it. Proverbs four, uh, 24, 9, the thought of foolishness is sin. I wonder if anybody's had a foolish thought. Yeah, there you go. So if we had to promise to sin again, or never to sin again, we'd never make, by the way, that would be us trusting us anyway. 
We all leave good things undone every day, every day and ought to be done every day. Uh, and the Bible says, as I alluded earlier, that even our best in the flesh is sin. But we are all as an unclean thing, Isaiah tells us. All our righteousness are, are as filthy rags. We do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. God is so much more holy than we are that even our best, when put before Him, looks like filth. That's why we thank God that our salvation doesn't depend upon our living. It depends upon our look. Look to me and be you saved. The hymn says there's light for a look at the Savior and life more abundant and free. What does that mean to look? It means more than just admitting historical facts, which is what a lot of people do when you talk about Jesus. They look back in history. They open their uh, encyclopedia, which I have one. Y'all, they don't make that anymore. Uh, maybe y'all have one. Even the old ones talk about it. But anyway, now you look up online, whatever you want to call it. Oh, yeah, I, I see Jesus in history. They even talk about Jesus in history. But it's more than that. It's, it's more than believing that he lived. It's more trusting that he died. That he died for you and that he died for me, that he died for our sin uh, and uh, knowing whom he is. That's why Jesus asked his disciples in, in, in Mark 8 and verse 27, whom do men say that I am? Why don't you go out uh, down your neighborhood when you get home and ask the neighbors, uh, who is Jesus? You'll be in for some entertaining discussion. Who is, whom do men say that I am? And so they answered him. Some say you're John the Baptist. Some say you're Elijah or one of the prophets. Not one of them says you're God in the flesh. No. Whom do men say that I am? But then he turned the question around after they answered and said, But whom say ye that I am? Peter answereth and saith unto him, Thou art the Christ. That is the anointed one, the one sent from God, the only Savior of all mankind. And so to look, when we, it's not looking at, looking at historical facts. To look means to depend on. Now, uh, <laughs> I'll give you an instance of it. It might cause some of you to chuckle. It may cause all of you. I don't know. Maybe not. Maybe you think it, maybe it's going to be crickets. I don't know. But here's the thing. The other day, I saw President Biden out at the helicopter. And somebody asked him. Uh, are you going out uh, somewhere? Maybe it was California or something. Are you going to go ask Mr. Newsom to be the you know, second string in case you fall out? Who, who are you looking at? And President Biden looked at the reporter and said, I'm looking at you. You know what he was saying? He was saying, we're counting on you. It was a joke, right? Uh, we're counting on you. You're the one we're looking to. That's what we're talking about when we, when we look in the Bible, when it says, look to God, look to Jesus. It means to depend on, I'm counting on you. I'm looking at you. And so uh, this expression, again, uh, we see in Hebrews 2 and 12, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, not just directionally. That doesn't just mean directionally. It means dependently. We are looking at him as our Savior. Uh, the psalmist mentions the same thought in uh, Psalm 123 and verse 2. Behold, as the eyes of servants look unto the hand of their masters, and as the eyes of a maiden unto the hand of her mistress, so our eyes wait upon the Lord our God until he have mercy on us. That's what it means to look to Jesus. Jesus wrote the book. He's the one that brings it to pass. For as the Father hath life in him, so hath, the, uh, so ha uh, hath he given the Son to have life in himself. To look to Jesus uh, for salvation means to look away from everything else. In Galatians 5 and 4, the Bible says, Christ has become, listen, of no effect unto you, whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. Now, a lot of people take that verse and interpret it uh, that someone loses their salvation. But fallen from grace here basically means you either choose to establish your own righteousness by the law. You look to the law that says he that sinneth will, shall surely die. And you try to keep the law. Uh, or you look to Jesus. You can't look at both. 
And so to choose one, to choose the law, is to fall away from Christ. To choose Christ is to fall away from the law. That's salvation. You're choosing whom you're going to trust. You can't have it both ways. By the way, by the, way the law will never save you anyway. It will only continually condemn, condemn you of sin in your heart. There is no promise in the Bible for those who look partially to Christ and partially to other things. It means to trust Him completely. Paul did. And so he said in 2 Timothy 1 and 12, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. And so the Lord in this very verse uh, shows us the authority of salvation, the availability of salvation, the avenue of salvation. And finally, we see the assurance of salvation uh, right in that same first phrase, look unto me, watch now, and be ye saved. No question about it. That's assurance. Look unto me and be ye saved. Uh, what does the word saved mean anyway? I mean, you go around town here and talk to just about anybody and ask them, are they saved? Oh, yeah, I'm saved. Well, what church you go to? I don't go to church. Read your Bible. I don't read my Bible. I don't pray. Matter of fact, uh, I enjoy cussing and drinking and smoking and carousing. But I'm saved. What does saved mean? Well, what does it mean? Uh, it, it, uh, uh, it means to be delivered from imminent danger. If you rescue somebody from sinking in water, you've saved them from the imminence of drowning. If you pull them from a burning building, you've saved them from the imminence of burning to death. The Bible word saved means you're saved from the imminent danger of death without Christ and eternal torment in hell. Death could come at any moment, we said a moment ago. Uh, we're just one heartbeat out of eternity. Jesus spoke of hell in Mark 9 and verse 43 when he said, If thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It's better for thee to enter into life maimed than to uh, two hands uh, to go into hell, uh, into the fire that, uh, that never shall be quenched, where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. And if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It's better for thee to enter halt into life than having two feet to be cast into hell, uh, into the fire that shall never be quenched. And if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. It's better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire, where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. Now I'm telling you, hell must be an awful place for the Lord to make such statements. And of course, he doesn't literally mean there to cut you a foot off and your hand off and your eye off. He's talking about you need to do whatever. Uh, you need to make sure that you remove whatever hindrance is keeping you from salvation. What is that for you? Pride? I know people right now, God's Holy Spirit, to dig on their hearts and work on them. And they know they need to be saved, but they won't do it for pride's sake. Well, my mama or my grandma, they already think I'm saved. I, I couldn't dare let them down. So in the hell you go for eternity? I'm going to tell you one thing. If your mama, grandma, grandpa, whoever it was loves you like they ought to, they want you to know salvation truly. Not trying to cover up because of some pride in your heart. What is the eye or the hand or the foot that's keeping you from Christ? What is it? The person who looks to Jesus Christ and Him alone is saved from hell. Now, most religions don't teach that. Most religions and many of those that uh, claim the name of Christian don't teach that. They teach that, uh, you know, uh, that uh, it's a matter of uh, looking to Jesus and He puts us in the position to be saved if we tack on the end there what you want to. But the Bible says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised Him from the dead... Thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. Uh, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And Hebrews reminds us that if we do so, Jesus is able to save us to the uttermost. And by the way, having used the illustrations we did of first responders and all, we wouldn't expect a lifeguard to save a child from drowning and then throw him back in the water, would we? 
And so the Lord says in John 10 and 27, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. In John 5 and 24, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. In John 6 and 37, All that the Father giveth me, Jesus said, shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. Some 2,000 years ago, God took every sin that you and I ever committed and will ever commit and laid them on Jesus Christ, his son. Isaiah tells us in chapter 53 and verse 6, all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Paul said it in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, for he hath made him, Jesus, to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. He has already made the payment in full. Matter of fact, that's what the, 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 uh, uh, the, the literal idea there of his, uh, of his words, it is finished on the cross. It is finished. Mean, paid in full. Paid in full. Nobody's asking you to join a church. Nobody's asking you to give money. Uh, nobody's asking you to become a monk and live in a cave somewhere. Not at all. What, what's being asked of God is that you make dead sure that you are trusting Christ and Him alone for your salvation. And to be clear that He stands ready to save those who come. Look unto me and be ye saved all the ends of the earth. For I am God and there is none else. Let's stand together, please, and bow our heads.